Hello there, and a very warm welcome to Chazingra Chats, the show where we take a stroll through the life stories of people in the Pokemon community, discovering the six Pokemon on their dream team along the way. I'm Charlie Merriman, Merry by name, Merry by nature, otherwise known as Chazingra, a host and commentator for the Pokemon Video Game Championship series, and a content creator. And this week, as every week, I very much hope my guest and I can make your day merry, because I have the honour of being joined by Jake Muller. Jake, how are you? I'm great, Charlie. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited. I love your show, and <laughs> I was hoping to be able to come on at some point, so I was very happy when you uh, messaged me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I remember you mentioning back a, um, a few months ago, um, saying how much you enjoyed the show. And I mean, you were always on my list, Jake. You were always going to be on the show at some point. <laughs> um, and so brilliant to be able to feature you now. And for anyone who's not so familiar with you, Jake, can you give a brief introduction to yourself? Yeah, so I am one of the casters on the North America team, kind of a counterpart to Charlie on the European team. Uh, I've been playing VGC since 2013. Uh, I've been at Worlds a couple times, uh, flopped every single time I got there, but I've had a wonderful experience with VGC over the last, what, 11 years now, which is kind of crazy. And I'm I'm really happy with kind of my journey throughout my, my Pokemon career and get to talk about it today <laughs> mm, yeah i'm looking forward to taking a deeper dive into it it's um it must be so good to just feel like now as a caster you can give back to the community that uh, gave you so much in your competitive years and yeah jake and i were just saying before we started recording that uh, we actually this is the first time we've met really i mean yeah. we've messaged but <laughs> yeah. this is the first time we've met face to face in inverted commas uh, right. of course we are just screen to screen right now but uh, so looking forward to um Getting to know you a whole lot better, Jake. And why don't we dive straight into things? So let's learn a little bit more about you and the six Pokemon that you've chosen for your dream team. I believe what we're starting with here, and it's interesting, we're starting with rediscovering <laughs> Pokemon at the county fair, which I imagine will lead into how you discovered Pokemon in the first place as well. Yeah, yeah. So hmm. I uh, have always enjoyed games, video games, board games, card games, whatever. Uh, and so when I was younger, I think for my fourth birthday, my parents got me a Game Boy Color. Uh, and I remember it was, a, it was a purple Game Boy Color. It was also maybe the reason why I like purple so much, but that's a different conversation. Hmm. Um, and I would just, you know, play whatever games they, they picked up for me. And at one point, they got me and my sister Pokemon Gold and Silver. Uh, and I we, like played that back and forth a little bit. She wasn't as big of a fan of it. She's never really been a big video gamer, so it very quickly became I had gold and silver instead of us kind of sharing between them. Uh, and I played through that, had a really good time. I had some fun memories getting stuck in the ice cave for <laughs> multiple years on end. Uh, and when Ruby and Sapphire came out, I had a Game Boy Advance and I played, I think it was Ruby at the time. But then at a certain point while I was playing games, my parents, being the you know wonderful parents they are, wanted the best for me and everything. This is certainly no shade to them, but they were like, you're probably playing a little too much video games right now for a seven-year-old. Like, maybe go outside some, which was probably correct. Um, and so they they essentially made me, like, trade in a lot of my video games at once um, just to, like, encourage me to be more active and not just sit inside all day, which I really can't fault them for. Um, but I kept the system. Like, I had my Game Boy Advance still. Uh, I just like all the Pokemon games were gone. A bunch of other games were also gone, and so that was just kind of it for a while. Um, then one year, there's there's the Central Florida Fair. So I, I grew up in Orlando, Florida. Uh, the Central Florida Fair was every summer. There was a bunch of like carnival games and like rides and amusement park type stuff there. And I went with a couple friends one night, one summer. This is probably late middle school, early high school. I don't even remember honestly. But I was getting onto a ride. They were, like, loading us onto, like, the cars and the rides. One of the rides, it just, like, spins around. And I sat down in the seat, and I looked down at the, like, floor of the car, and there was just a copy of Pokemon Emerald sitting there. So just, just, like, sitting there on the floor of that ride. Obviously, someone just, like, had it with them and dropped it. I don't really know how it got there, but I picked it up, and I was like, oh, Pokemon. I liked Pokemon a while ago. I just kept it. I didn't, like, try and find <laughs> who it was that lost it. Maybe I should have turned it into Lost and Found or something, so if if you're at the Central Florida Fair sometime in the early 2010s and you lost Pokemon Emerald, I'm so sorry. Um, but I just kept it, and I, like, took it home and started playing it again, and I was like, oh, huh. Wait, this is actually really fun. I need to, like, play this again. And I don't remember if Diamond and Pearl were already out at that time. 
I, I really have no concept of like what year this was, but I know that either Diamond and Pearl were about to come out or they had already come out not too long ago. So I went to my parents and I was like, hey, look, I know we like cut off the video games a while ago, but I really want to play this again. And they said, okay, fine, whatever. And so they let me get like a, a DS and buy, I think I had Pearl first, which yeah, I definitely had Pearl first because I bought Shining Pearl when those came out as a, as a throwback. Um, but I played through Pearl and it was kind of just all over from there. I, I got, you know, pretty much every game since then. For a while I was buying both games when they came out. I definitely had Black and White and Black and White 2 and X and Y. Um, and that re-hooked me on Pokemon. It just became like my favorite game pretty instantly. Uh, and I remember Black and White was the first games that came out after I was like back into it. That was the first time I experienced like a release with everyone. I have all like the Japanese names for the black and white Pokemon, but not the like English localized ones yet. And so I knew like all the Japanese names for these Pokemon before we knew what they were called in English. And it, it was it was a really special experience, and that kind of just hooked me on Pokemon again. And it's been uphill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's um, that. I cannot believe that you just sat down on that ride out there yeah. and there was Pokemon Emerald on the floor. Yeah. Of all the games as well, I mean, Emerald, certainly by today's standards, one of the rarest, most coveted oh, yeah. games to uh, to come across. So, wow, that really was fate. I mean, your parents could try and keep you away from Pokemon, <laughs> but Pokemon just found its way back into your life. That's uh, yeah, absolutely stunning. Um, <laughs> wow. And then... Yeah, getting stuck in the ice path, that's something that quite a few guests have uh, I, mentioned yeah. <laughs> on the show. Shay, uh, Shay Burton, TCG caster, spent yeah. a long old time trying to work out how to get through there, and multiple others as well. Um, so, yeah, interesting to learn all, all of these experiences that we were struggling with, but uh, obviously we didn't know each other at the time. But uh, yeah. rest assured, Jake, that you were in uh, yeah. good company there, because ice path, yeah. Bit of a labyrinth in Generation 2. So, yeah. if you had... Again, you said your sister wasn't so into it. So if you had both gold and silver, were you also able to trade with yourself? I don't know if we ever had the link cable. Mm. It's like we, I had both games and we both had a Game Boy Color, but I don't know if we ever actually got the cable that enabled it. I don't have any memories of us like trading mm. or battling each other. So I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, I have since have, you know, I, at a certain point, I've had like multiple 3DSs or something. So I've had the ability to do that. I remember doing that a lot in like Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, for example. Mm. Um, but back with my sister, I don't think we ever did, and I don't. I don't honestly don't know if she's like touched a video game since then. <laughs> mm. um, she's much more like outdoorsy and active than I am. It's, <laughs> To each their own, but I like sitting inside sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Pearl, and then. Black and white, X and Y, and it all mm -hmm. went from there. I mean, hopefully at that point as well, your parents decided, okay, you're that much older now. Maybe you can, maybe you can approach playing the video games in a more uh, healthy, measured way. Yeah, they would like you know give me certain time limits. Like, okay, you can play for an hour today, or you yeah. can play for like thirty minutes this morning and thirty minutes this afternoon, or whatever else. Mm. It really took me going off to college and starting VGC to like make them realize like oh this is like a real hobby like it's not just something he's doing to waste time um but and they're they're very supportive now but it, it took some it was a learning curve i think every parent at that time was like wondering what these video games were and you know if they were you know influencing us in bad ways or whatever mm -hmm. that was that was the topic at the time but you know they, they're very much supportive now which is really fun yeah and i mean the competitive circuit now um I mean, that didn't exist back when we were very much younger, and so it yeah. really has. Mm -hmm. The franchise has evolved. It's a cheesy yeah. term to use in this uh, <laughs> setting, but it really has. And let's go on from there. Let's evolve from there into the first <laughs> Pokemon on your Dream Team. So, the way this works is that Jake has decided on these Pokemon in advance. I have no idea what they are. The aim is not for Jake to build the most competitively viable team at all. It's just the ones that are most special to him in any way that he can define for himself. So, illuminate us, Jake. Who's the first Pokemon on your Dream Team? It's good that it doesn't have to be competitively viable, because mine won't even be competitively legal. Uh, <laughs> my, my first one has to be Victini. It's gotta be. Victini is, has always been my favorite Pokemon ever since it was released. I don't really have a reason why, other than I just like him. 
he, it's very cute. It's very fun. He represents victory, which is always like a fun, empowering thing. Uh, and like I said, Black and White was the first games I experienced the release of. So I was like following everything along. I was like waiting for release day. Uh, and when Black and White released, there was an event for like, the, I forget the name of the item, actual the key item, but like it was a pass to the Liberty Garden, which mm-hmm. is where you caught Victini uh, in Black and White. You took the little boat from one of the piers at Castilia City. Uh, and I just remember that being like a really cool experience. It's like, oh my gosh, I have this like event ticket that you just can't get after a certain point in time. Uh, and now I get to go catch this cool Pokemon. And I'm pretty sure I used it, used that Victini on my first playthrough and I just fell in love with him ever since then. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, so you said that Black and White were the first games that you were sort of um, present for the release for. Yeah. Uh, mm. you'd, you'd, yeah, you'd found that you'd been blessed with this cartridge of Emerald. <laughs> and then, uh, as you said, Generation 4 was kind of already out, or just on the horizon. But then Generation 5, yeah. you were sort of seated and ready for that to right. come out. <laughs> and so I can see how... Also, with that bonus, oh, this is this is an exclusive Pokemon um, that would give you an a special um, a special tie to Victini. Yeah, I remember when I I I treated myself to Pokemon White version after the end of my the end of my high school essentially, mm. and so that was a few months after the release. So I'd missed the boat quite literally for Victini. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, so yeah, I remember thinking, ah, that's such a shame. But uh, I'm now living that vicariously through you, Jake. So uh, I'm so you're pleased so that you're able to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I still had that Victini that I got in that first game. At, at one point, in I think it was 2015, I had a backpack stolen and had like all my old games in it. So I, I don't have the, the first Victini I ever caught anymore, which is sad. But there was a the distribution at the 2022 World Championships in London yeah. uh, that I was able to go to uh, attend as a spectator. So I made sure to get the distribution Victini from that one. So I still have one. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's such a shame. Um, <laughs> yeah, wow. But uh, yeah, as you say, at least at least you do have a Victini now. I was also there at Worlds 2022 as a spectator. Who knows? Maybe nice. we crossed paths, but we just had no idea. Yeah. We were there at that point. Um, anyway, Victini, stamping its mark on your team, and now we're going to walk our own victory road over to the next thing you want to talk about, which is, well, your introduction to VGC, a perfect segue from there, and your breakout season, yeah. and all the way through to uh, then taking a step back. Yeah, so I first found VGC kind of by accident. Uh, I was not like super active or like well-known, uh, but I was playing a bunch of like you know Gen 4, Gen 5, singles um and i really enjoyed that and one time i think i was just browsing youtube and this like pokemon world championships popped up in my suggestions it's like what is this Uh, that's that's cool i want i want this uh so i just opened it and it was the stream for the 2013 world championships which i it's either the first or second worlds they ever streamed it was scott and evan doing all the casting uh and i watched you know aaron's famous top four match live I watched Arash win with the Mamoswine Swine team, which was really fun. Uh, and I saw that, and I was like, wait, they have two Pokemon at the same time? What? <laughs> you can't do that. How do you do that? Uh, and I like looked more into it, and I realized, like, wait, these are like actual like tournaments that people go to. Uh, and I grew up like playing sports and going to tournaments on the weekends a lot. And so the, the idea that I could do that for this video game that I love, too, was really exciting. So I looked into, you know, when the next tournaments were. Um, this this was right as I was starting university. So I graduated from high school in 2013. Worlds was like August 2013, right when I was about to move to school. And so I looked for something that fall. And there was a regional in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And one of my best friends from high school was going to college in Philadelphia. So I was like, oh, how convenient. I'll go visit her and go play in this tournament. You know, whatever. See what it's like. Uh, and so I like managed to get a team together in game. I flew up to Pennsylvania to go visit her. And then that's, uh, this was when regionals were still one day, I think. So it was just Sunday. Um, I showed up and I started that regional five and O it's like, Oh, huh, maybe I'm kind of good at this. I ended up going six, two and, and barely missing top cut, but like doing that well at my first event was like kind of a shocker to me. I, I've always thought I was like decent at games in general and I've, I'm, somewhat competitive when the time calls for it but i didn't expect to kind of show up and do that well right off the bat and that kind of hooked me immediately unfortunately <laughs> i was like oh i have to find somebody more to go to um 
and I, I really had a really good time with it. The The second regional I attended was Orlando that same season. Obviously, I'm, I'm from Orlando. My family still lived there at the time. Uh, and I was in university like six or so hours away by car. So I just drove home for the weekend. Uh, it was also like around the same time as my birthday. So it was kind of convenient to just go home and see my family and friends and go do this other Pokemon thing. Uh, and then I met some really good friends at that Orlando regional who I still talk to to this day. I like went to their weddings a couple of years ago. Um, and it, it, at that point it was over. Like I knew I was just doing this. This was my thing now. Um, and I had so much fun. I, that 2013, 2014 season, I think I went like six and two, seven, two at a regional or two, but never cut anything. And then when 2015 came around and we were in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire with the new mega evolutions, I was like, okay, I'm going to do something cool this season. I really want to top cut my first regional. Uh, and so I, November of 2014, I think is when Alpha or Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire came out. Uh, and so February of 2015 was my first regional in the 2015 format. I went to the St. Louis regional. Um, and so I think from like December to February, I started working on this one team uh, and I just stuck with it that whole time. I showed up to that regional. I went nine and zero in Swiss and made my first top cut. It's like, yes, okay, I'm here. I'm really doing it. Uh, and so at that point, I was like, okay, I'm I'm not like, obviously not the best, but I could be one of the best if I keep trying. Uh, and that just reinforced, like, okay, I really love VGC. I want to keep doing it. It's been so much fun. Uh, there is Nugget Bridge was a, a website we used to have as like our community hub. It was a forum, had a bunch of like resource articles and whatnot. They hosted a big online tournament every year called the Nugget Bridge Major. And this is like back in the day, like a thousand people playing in one tournament was kind of unheard of. And the Nugget Bridge Major that year had, I think, 1332 is the number that sticks in my head, like over 1300 players. Uh, and I ended up winning that whole thing. Uh, and so between top cutting that regional at 9 0, which was like beyond just top cutting, going 9 0 in Swiss at a regional was really cool. And then winning that big tournament that summer, I was really proud of myself and really excited to like keep going on with VGC. And I also managed to qualify for the World Championships in 2015 for the first time. And that was back when, and we're back to it this year, of course, but this was before the championship point bar where you just had to reach a certain number. Uh, in 2015, you had to be top 40 in North America to make Worlds. And I was number 40. <laughs> so <laughs> I barely snuck right in there in my first year of like really trying to like grind for a Worlds invitation, which was really exciting. Uh, I went to Worlds, didn't do super hot, but I was like, you know what? It's Worlds. I, I'm still new. I went like two and four, I think, which, you know, what, whatever. It, I wasn't too upset, uh, but I just caught the bug and I really wanted to keep playing. Kept pushing through like you know, 2016 season. Got a few more regionals, did okay at nationals. Um, made Worlds again in 2016. Uh, again, kind of didn't do great. I, I, my Worlds performances are like two and four and then one and three. Because um, I think in 2016, they immediately cut you if you uh, took your third loss. I was like, well, okay, I'll just enjoy the weekend. 2017, I took a small break because I actually did a semester abroad uh, and I in England, actually. I was, at, I was in Reading for a semester. Um, so I didn't, you know, try for a World's Invite that year, but I came back in 2018. It's like, this is my year. I've gone like X2, or I, I've, I've been one win away from making day two at Nationals slash NEIC uh, for like three years in a row, and I missed it every year. So 2018, I'm going to make day two at NEIC, and I'm going to do well at Worlds. NEIC rolls around. I finally go seven and two on day one, make it into day two. I was one win off of making top eight, which was really exciting. I got 12th instead, which I was still super proud of. Uh, and then Worlds came around and I completely bombed. Like worse than before, I went 03. It was in Nashville and it happened to be like the same weekend as my dad's 60th birthday. So they knew I'd be in Nashville. The whole family came up to Nashville and I was going to see them while I was at Worlds. But I, on Friday during day one, I just completely had this mental break. I was I played so badly. I was starting graduate school like a week or two after that. And so I just completely freaked out and like went 03, changed my flights home to that evening and just left. I didn't even stay for that whole weekend because I was so like miserable and and stressed out about this new thing I was about to be doing and like why did I even come? I have to get ready for grad school and I'm I've now like crashed out of worlds three years in a row. Am I really Am I just bad? Like, do I not deserve to like be here at all? And 
all these feelings coming through and it, it became too much for me to handle at the time. Uh, it, it was overwhelming and I just needed to cut it off. Um, and so I did. I, I left Worlds early. I didn't really play VGC again for six months or so. And even when I came back, it was just using like a meme team at the regional down the road from my parents' house so I could see people and not really care about the result because that's what was kind of eating at me that whole time. Uh, and I, I stayed involved. Obviously, I had some really good friends that I kept up with and I was like watching results and stuff. But the combination of that like mental break and being in grad school where I had so much less time and money to spend, I just needed to step back. Uh, and so I, I took a little break around 2018, 2019. Wow. Thank you for your honesty with what you shared there, Jake. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I'm glad that you highlighted the mental aspect of competing because it's whether it's what you're experiencing juggling big life changes alongside playing in a big tournament or just just competing itself the number of things you have to bear in mind is really yeah. so important to keep your um mental attitude in the right state as well of course as physically the long tournament days um and yeah, well, I guess, I guess unfortunately it's one of those things where sometimes we we don't know how hard we're pushing ourselves until it's too far, but yep. then we learn from that, I guess. It, it was, I don't know if I was even, like, pushing myself too hard. I don't think I was, like, spending too much time, like, preparing or practicing or anything. I was just putting way too much of my, I guess, self-value, self-worth in this, like, Pokemon thing that I knew I was, like, decently good at. And when I failed to perform at it, I was like, well, I, I care too much about, do I care too much about this? Like, mm. is, is this too important to me? Or am I like, am, am I just delusional? <laughs> like, do I, do I think I have some like greater capability than I actually do? Um, and it, it took like some like reprogramming to essentially just like, Hey, this is like a fun thing you do. And like, sometimes you do well at it and sometimes you don't. And that's how it goes. And you just need to be like aware of that. <laughs> mm. Those are really wise words. It's, uh, I think it can be all too easy to um, yeah. fall into that temptation of ascribing too much of yourself to VGC or whatever hobby it might be. And so yeah. really, really important to keep that more zoomed out perspective. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm very, very pleased you sort of listened to yourself there and you focused on grad school for a bit. When you went to your next regional, it was just for fun, more to see the friends that you made. And, of course, those yeah. are the most important things about this scene. These are the things that stick with us as the people that we meet. Yeah, it was fun for me. I, I, I made it probably not very fun for my opponents because was, <laughs> this is terrible. I was using Chansey and Shedinja okay. at this regional. <laughs> I was like, you know what? If I'm not having a good time with Pokemon, no one else can. <laughs> And they're all going to hate me, and that's fine. And I had some, like, really funny matches that tournament. <laughs> that is such a villain origin story. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I only did it once. I got my fill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, dear. But then um, jumping right back to the start of what you said, you know, you, you happened to catch that there was a world stream on that year, yeah. and it was Evan and Scott commentating. It must, yeah. it must be so surreal for you now, or when you started casting, to say, oh, you guys that I watched, you're now my colleague. Truly. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's crazy. I got to watch them in eleven years ago now, cast that tournament, and that's why I play VGC. And then I got to be cast by them at that regional that I went nine and oh at. That was that happened to be the first regional they streamed on the official channel. Uh, and I got on stream during Swiss and it was Scott and Evan and I was like, Oh, this is so cool. They get to cast my match and they did my my top sixteen match as well. Uh, and then I think in 2018 at NAIC, I was on stream twice and they were doing both of those matches. It's like, ah, oh, this is great. Uh, and now I get to like work with them as their peer. I, I cast a whole regional with Evan last season and I've done a couple matches with Scott and it's, it's honestly surreal. Like I, to, to think that like they got me into VGC and now I'm like on the same stage as them as, as their peers is, is really special. <laughs> mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, what a fairy tale. And yeah, uh, yeah so, um, so brilliant that, you know, we can set ourselves these goals in any given tournament and uh, 
we aspire to that, but the fact that you are actually able to go ahead and, yeah, I, I did top cut. And then, yeah, just keep building the success from there season on season. is uh, That's something that I hope that you can feel really proud of. And we're going to go yeah. over from there into what the next Pokemon is on your dream team. So who's going to join Victini? So Victini will be joined by kind of the centerpiece of that team that I used to go 9-0 to at that first regional I top cut, and that is Metagross. Uh, I was using Mega Metagross at that tournament. That was like the first thing I saw when I was looking at the 2015 format. It's like, I think this Pokemon is going to be really good. Uh, and I was using uh, kind of an unorthodox set on it. I was running Substitute on it, which is why you'll see here I have the, the Mega Metagross plush with the Substitute oh, yeah. right in front of it. <laughs> uh, after, I, after I went and I know at that regional, I bought those for myself. I was like, you know what? I earned that. <laughs> and I've kept them ever since. Um, but that was Metagross to me is like, my first success in VGC, and it's always been really special to me for that reason. And we've gone from, you know, competitively illegal to competitively <laughs> incredibly viable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All in the space of two slots. Yeah. Um, when you were looking at Mega Metagross that time, what made you think, this is going to be good? Uh, it matched up well into a lot of the other pretty good Mega Evolutions. Like, Kangaskhan was, like, the one to beat, and having something that just resisted, like, Return and Fake Out and everything mm. was really attractive. Uh, Amoongus was huge and like Zen Headbutt was really good into it. This is right after fairies were introduced and having a steel type to resist all the fairy damage was important. Uh, and I really liked how it paired with Hydreigon. That was kind of the other like center point of that team. They had really good defensive synergy with each other. So it kind of started with that combo and I really loved it. Uh, some people were running like Ice Punch for, for Landorus, but I really love Substitute because it allowed you to play around like Sucker Punches. Like if you're going to be using Metagross to beat Kangaskhan, but it just Sucker Punches you anyway, what's the point? But if you Substitute, you're like buying yourself so much time. You can sub in front of a Moongus, which made it like really mm. difficult to deal with. Uh, and so I think Substitute kind of allowed me to play it a little bit more defensively while still having like the, the huge offensive options as well. So mm. it was a really fun set that I'm, I'm honestly still really proud of, um, that kind of thought process. Like, hey, I, I can take this Pokemon that I think Metagross was kind of middle of the pack in terms of people's ideas of competitively viable Mega Evolutions at the time. Mm. But I really liked it, and so I was just committed to it, and it paid off. And I, I, that was the first time I had really built a team like that that had that success. Uh, and it, coinciding with my first top cut performance as well felt really good. <laughs> mm. Really well summarized. Fantastic. Okay, well, we're going to bullet punch from there over to <laughs> Theatre Kid, to Casting Pipeline. Now, this is something I'm very <laughs> interested by as someone who is an actor slash writer themselves. So tell us. Yeah, I, I've always loved theater, like like stage performances, musicals, all that stuff. Uh, my mom and I are both big theater fans. Like for her for her birthday a few years ago, we went to New York um, and we both love tennis as well. So we went to the US Open, the big tennis tournament there every year, and we saw a show on Broadway. Like that's just the kind of stuff that, that we do. Um, and I've always, I was involved with my like theater program in high school. Uh, I did like some of the technical backstage stuff for a while, and then I actually like started performing as well. So I've been in like like Beauty and the Beast and um, what was I one of the single oh senior year musical uh, Bye Bye Birdie that's the one I was the dad in Bye Bye Birdie which was really fun uh, but I've always just really loved theater and I didn't realize until like the end of high school that I actually enjoyed the performance aspect of it as well uh, and so as I was in Pokemon of course my introduction to VGC being the stream that was always kind of in the back of my head like this could be something that could be fun to do, but I'm not nearly good enough yet. And like, I'm not going to worry about that right now. Uh, and I think it wasn't until like 2016 or so, maybe 2015 that I started thinking like, maybe I want to end up being a caster one day. Uh, I spent a summer in Pennsylvania doing like a research thing during college. So I was near the New York, New Jersey area and I was good friends with Jen Badamo, who's like the, the TO from that area at the time. Uh, and she always had her streams going at her locals. So I was like, hey, you have this mid-season showdown. What if I came and cast it? And she was like, oh, yeah, sure, come on. So I drove over to New Jersey for a weekend and I cast this mid-season showdown. I, I know Joe Brown was there. I think more people that... I, I forget who else was on the cast. I know Joe Brown was there. And Brendan, Brendan Lewis was also there. And we got to like do that one together, which was really fun. Uh, and then eventually there was a like a call sent out by the old uh, broadcast coordinator at DBCI saying like, Hey, we're looking to add more people to our team. Send me reels. 
I didn't have a reel. I didn't have the like video editing experience at the time to like put an actual reel together. So instead, I just like went through every single vod that I had like collected of me casting and just made a link to every single like match I had done with timestamps. And I emailed and I was like, "Hey, I don't have an actual reel, but I have all these matches I've cast." here you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't think it would work because like, obviously, I don't know, it wasn't very professional. I wanted to be on the official team, but never thought I actually would be at that point. And it, it turned into me doing my first official regional at Dallas in 2020. That was my first time like on official TPCI broadcast. And that was such a dream come true. It was so much fun. It was my parents had moved to Dallas itself mm -hmm. uh, at the time. So I got to like go home and do my first regional like at home essentially, which was so cool, um, and it was it was great. Uh, I was scheduled to do a couple more that season, and then everything shut down because of COVID. And I was like, well, I got my one. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, at that time it was like unsure whether it would come back, right? Like we all had that thought. Uh, it, it was always going to come back eventually, but like in what capacity was kind of a big question mark. Um, but I mentioned I, I was attending that 2022 World Championships. Uh, and after that event, I had, that was the first event I had attended post-COVID, uh, and I had just had so much fun, so much fun at that Worlds. Um, just like being in the venue, being with friends that I hadn't seen in so long, just experiencing Pokemon again. I was like, I'm going to give one last shot. And that was going to be it for me. Like if I didn't hear anything back after that, I was going to be okay with it ending and that being like the end of that chapter in my, my VGC experience. But I'm so thankful that they brought me back on uh, for the the regional season back in 2022, or 23, sorry, early 2023. Was it 23? Oh, God. Yeah, yes, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was February of 2023 was when I came back. Um, and I've, I've been a part of the team ever since. I got to do my first international championship this summer. I did NEIC back in June, which was incredible. Um, and I just had so much fun and I'm so thankful that they they put me back on but it, it was really my like theater experience being on stage uh and like being part of this like this group of people that are creating this product that is meant to be viewed by everyone else that got me interested in casting and that's I don't I don't perform theater stuff anymore I still go watch shows all the time um but that that's kind of scratching that itch for me now is this ability to be part of this production essentially that is a viewing experience and it's really cool. Mm, yeah. Um, tennis and live theater. I mean, that's me all <laughs> over as well, Jay. I, I, yeah. I love both those things. Nice. Um, what's a one line summary of Bye Bye Birdie? Uh, it's, it's kind of a parody of Elvis. Like oh. it's, it's Elvis. There's like an Elvis like character and he gets drafted into the war and there's this like, campaign to like get him out of that and he does this like um birdie's the guy conway conway birdie oh i'm i'm missing his name birdie's the guy's last name mm -hmm. um and he like comes to this small town because this girl wins a contest for like one last kiss with birdie before he goes off to war and i played that girl's dad so it was like oh this guy's coming in and trying to kiss my daughter and <laughs> Whatever else. It was some like big publicity stunt. I'm, I'm not explaining it super great, but basically <laughs> this, this character, Birdie, was Elvis, or yeah. an Elvis-themed thing, and it was like him coming into this small town and wreaking havoc. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, that sounds fun. I'm sure you played that part very well. I uh, would love to have seen <laughs> your performance in that. Um, and it just goes to show, you know, you, um, you stuck to what you really enjoyed, and you, yeah. it just goes to show what can come from putting yourself out there, and sticking to your plan, um, so that's that's really really good to to hear. And such a oh, must have been so disappointing for you to have had casted that one regional and then just completely um, yeah <laughs> complete uh, circumstances that no one was prepared for. Of course, <laughs> it must have felt uh, yeah just just typical. But I mean, what a uh, yeah what a crazy time for the world. Um, but hey. That's behind us now, as you say. You've casted your yeah. first international <laughs> championships, and um, yeah, it's 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 great that you know you had that thought when you were much younger. Yeah, maybe this casting thing. I could see myself doing that one day, and here you are. Um, yeah. Again, just you stuck to your plan, and now we're gonna ask you what the third Pokemon is gonna be on your dream team, alongside Victini and Mega Metagross. All right, this one is a little bit of a curveball. I was trying to think of a Pokemon that related to my like casting or like 
Pokemon content creation experience. Uh, and I did a podcast with a really good friend, Brendan Lewis, for like two or three years. Uh, and it was called Soundproof. And we both picked like a Pokemon to be kind of our mascot. And he is, Obama Snow is one of his favorite Pokemon. And Obama Snow is hidden ability is Soundproof. Uh, so he went with Snover, the, the little form. It's like, well, what other like cute little baby Pokemon has Soundproof? And I was looking through them and Mime Jr., is one of them. And Mime Jr. is adorable. And I think kind of ties into the whole, like, it, it's like, a, it's a mime. It's, it, mime is like a performance artist. And so since then, I've really liked Mime Jr. So Mime Jr. is going to be my third Pokemon. <laughs> mm, very nice. Yeah. Mime Jr. That's not a Pokemon I think about a whole lot, but you're so right. I don't right. think many it's, people do. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, very cute. And you're so right. It does tie in very well with, um, with the performing that you, uh, that you mentioned there. And so what was the nature of the Soundproof podcast? Uh, it was essentially just like a VGC talk show. We'd often have, well, it, we kind of split it into two parts. The first half was like a recap of VGC events in the last couple of weeks. We, we, only, we did it bi-weekly. So it was like the last two weeks, these are the tournaments that have happened. These are results. This is what's going on on the ladder. Um, and we just kind of talk about, you know, the VGC happenings. And then the second half, we would usually talk about a certain like topic but that's more of a like discussion about current events or like an aspect of vgc like prepping for team like prepping for a tournament how to team build um that kind of stuff we'd often have a guest for that second half come on that's more of an expert in that aspect of like the vgc experience so we had a really good time making that uh we started it i think right after nec in 2019 we kept it going for a while but COVID also kind of killed that because when half your show is like VGC event results and all the events mm. have been canceled, not a whole lot we could be doing there. Uh, we brought it back in 2022, I think in a different form uh, where we would go back and analyze old VODs either like of recent tournaments or we sometimes would do like retro events from like 2015, 14, 16, whatever. And that was really fun. But eventually we both just got a little bit too busy uh, to continue that. So that, I think, lasted about a year or so. And the first run was probably about a year and a half. So, like, two and a half years in total producing this podcast was really fun. <laughs> mm, yeah. that's. Uh, I'm glad I, had, glad I had a good run, although, once more, shame that uh, COVID was a spanner in the works. Yeah. There. But Mr. <laughs> M- well, Mime Jr. is a uh, fantastic third member of the team. Now, let's go from there into, of course... VGC is one thing, but your competitive <laughs> Go playing and indeed trading card game as well seems to be really taking off. Yeah, so I, I, I played Pokemon Go as like a casual player, like from day one. Like I, the, the, my account, I think the registration date is like one or two days after the game launched. Um, and so I've always really enjoyed Go as a game. I, honestly, I just enjoy Pokemon and like anything that uses the Pokemon IP I'm probably in on. Hmm. Um, but Go is like a really fun experience. Everyone, like, I was in college at the time, and the summer it came out, I was staying on campus, and the friends I had that were still there for the summer, we would just like go walk around campus and play Go like every other day or so. So it was a really cool experience, and of course everyone that is interested in Pokemon at least downloaded Go once, mm-hmm. um, and I just happened to stick through it. I, I'm still a pretty active player. I was doing some Zosh and Raids this morning before we mm-hmm. recorded. Um, but it became... Like, PvP wasn't a thing in Go when it first launched. It was added, like, two years later, I think. Uh, And when it got added, there were some grassroots groups popping up that would start hosting tournaments. And they would often be, like, rotating formats. So, like, one month there would be this format where these four types were legal, and then next month it would be, like, these three or four different types. And they would, like, theme their different, like, rule sets, basically the same as our, like, regulation sets in VGC currently um, around different types or Pokemon or concepts or whatever. Uh, and that was, that was fun. This was like 2019, I think when I was in grad school and like kind of taking a step away from VGC at the time and then go PVP popped up and I was like, okay, this is super non-committal. I can just like play it for fun. I can go to these little tournaments whenever I want, uh, and just have a good time. And so I got into it and my really close friend, Blake Hopper also was into it at the time. And one of our other friends from VGC named Nico was also getting into it. So the three of us kind of made our little competitive Go group chat. Uh, And this third party, like grassroots organization was called Sylf Arena. uh, And they started hosting regionals. So they would have like regionals 
similar to VGC regionals, except it was actually more like located to your regions. Like if you, I, I lived near Austin, Texas at the time. So I was in the Austin region. Blake was in Dallas. So he was in the Dallas region. So we played in those separate regionals. You can only enter one. Uh, and in 2020, when they were all online, of course, Blake and I both won our regionals. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Like, we're pretty good at this. Uh, and he still plays Go very competitively. He got like ninth at Worlds and then just got ninth at Baltimore Regionals as well. So he's like one of the best players. Uh, and I was like keeping up with him at the time. But then when VGC started to come back, I was like, okay, I like this a little more. I'm going to go back. And he just stuck with it. But I, I'm like pretty okay at Go PvP still. Uh, Dallas is like a weird hotspot for Go. It's like three or four of the best players in the country, if not the world, live here. And so if I go to locals, they're not easy, but I've managed mm. to like get points of them a few times. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and it, it was really just kind of a, a stopgap for my like competitive itch that I have sometimes when I wasn't doing VGC or when VGC like wasn't available to me. And I loved it because some of my VGC friends were still involved. I got to like talk competitive Pokemon with them regularly. And it was still just like the, the Pokemon it was Pokemon. I love Pokemon. I don't just love VGC. I love everything about Pokemon. Uh, and so I got to like experience Pokemon in a different way, uh, which was great. Yeah, I just, I'm still, there's like an online, like kind of similar to like the, the team tournaments we have in VGC. Um, there's one I'm still involved with in Go that I'll play for every week or so, which is great. Um, but also I, I like recently got into TCG almost by accident, like coming home from NAIC this year, I was with Blake, the, the, one who plays VGC and Go, uh, and my boyfriend at the airport in New Orleans. And our flight got delayed like six or seven hours. We were just stuck at the airport all day. And we were like, you know, there's this TCG Live app. We play mm -hmm. other Pokemon stuff. Let's just try it. So we all downloaded the app and all immediately were like, oh, wait, this is actually really fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I, in the last like four months or so, have gotten myself sucked into a third Pokemon game that I play. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have like... Way too many cards. In the last four months, I've bought so many cards. Many that I don't need, but all of them that I wanted, and I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> and I, like, started building decks, and I've gone to some, like, like league nights that aren't for championship points. Uh, and the first, like, league challenge that I went to, I ended up getting top 16 at, so I got some TCG championship points as well. Uh, and I, I, I tweeted this after it happened. I think I might might be the first person to have championship points in VGC, TCG, and Go all at the same time. Like I, I have, I currently hold points in all three games. And since this is only the second year that Go has had championship points, like maybe I'm the first, which would be kind of cool. No one corrected me when I tweeted it, so I'm just going to claim it. And if <laughs> someone comes along and says, wait, no, I did first, I'll be like, no, you didn't block. This um, is sad. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think... Someone who might lay a claim to that is uh, Schmon, Simon van der Voogst from oh, okay. um, yeah. Belgium. I, he was accumulating championship points last year. I, he, might, he might have had championship points in all three, or it might just be two. For the sake of your episode, Jay, let's, let's just say this. Let's <laughs> just say We're talking about me here. <laughs> of the other games, yeah, exactly. Um, but either way, I did. Schmon was my fourth guest on the show, so do check nice. out that episode yeah. if you uh, haven't already. Um, well, I mean, Pokemon Sleep as well, you, you want that? So I, I actually never got into sleep. I don't like okay. sleeping with my phone on my bed, and I didn't have the like device. So yeah. that's one I haven't gotten into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Well, you've got to draw a line somewhere, right. um, <laughs> I suppose. It's great that, yeah, I remember that summer when Pokemon Go came out. Oh, yeah. crazy. <laughs> it was something like, I remember seeing a, a meme about this, that all of a sudden everyone was playing Pokemon again, and it was like Blink-182 was back in the charts. And we, were like, <laughs> <laughs> we were back in the uh, early noughties, late 90s, yeah. all of a sudden, in the summer of 2016 <laughs> um that's brilliant that you've just been able to uh to keep that up well i mean who knows who knows what will go from here and i remember seeing that tweet sort of live when your <laughs> flight was delayed i remember seeing oh yeah we just on a whim we just downloaded this <laughs> this app and then all of a sudden i feel like you did a follow-up thing saying okay wait a second <laughs> this yeah, is no longer yeah. just for fun <laughs> this, is a, this is a thing <laughs> yeah. yeah wow well phenomenal um now let's go from there into who's gonna be joining Victini, Amazza Gross, uh, Mime Junior, of course, <laughs> Mime Junior, uh, on your dream team. Uh, so number four is going to be Skuntank. Uh, big Skuntank fan, mostly because that was kind of the 
like mascot of that group with like me, Blake, and Nico, and we started playing competitive Go. Um, Skuntank was like one of the best Pokemon in whatever format was the current Sylph like rotating format at the time. And so we all just started using Skuntank and we're like, oh, this Pokemon's really cool. Uh, and so it became our like, we our group chat was called like the Skunk Group Chat or something like that. And we, we'd always say Skunk Up was our, our, uh, our rallying cry. And so it just became like kind of a representative to me of competitive Pokemon Go. Uh, and that group with Blake and Nico, we don't we don't talk much in that group anymore. I think Nico stepped away and I obviously have other games I play now, but I will always think of Skuntank very fondly because of that time where I played so much competitive Pokemon Go. Um, and when I when I played through like Shining Pearl when that came out, I made sure to have a skun tank on that team, and mm-hmm. it was just a really like fun reminder of that period of my life that is kind of past now. I don't play I, like I'm not going to like regionals for Go anymore or anything, but uh, it I still love Go. Obviously, I still play it, and it's like a fun icon to me of of that period. Mm, skun tank, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that uh, Stunky and Skuntank is uh, exclusive to Diamond, actually. It is. So, I had a friend yeah. trade one. <laughs> That's a tra- okay, very nice. Okay, good. Um, please, you're still able to uh, get your fill of Skuntank. Yeah. yeah. And interesting that uh, something I've only just clocked, really, is that so far, your first three Pokemon in team, all part psychic type, at least. Um, oh, true. And yeah. now Skuntank is bringing the darkness there, so you've, uh, you're really complimenting. Nah. Um, that balance all of a sudden you have fire psychic steel psychic and psychic fairy and now poison dark yeah. um, interesting to see how that will develop but Skuntank okay <laughs> welcome to the team now let's go from there you went to school for meteorology but then yeah. you left the field I'm saying that to you as if you didn't realise wait what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jake I'm not sure if you're aware but, uh, but tell us about this <laughs> yeah so in, in high school I wasn't sure what I wanted to study when I went to college uh I ended up, when I first went to college, I ended up studying chemistry, mostly because I really liked my chemistry class I took in high school. That was one of my favorite classes. Um, And I thought maybe I wanted to go into some kind of medicine or pharmacy or like some kind of field like that after college. I was like, oh, chemistry is a good way to get there. Uh, So I went to college for chemistry for a year and a half. And in my fourth semester, like the end of my second year, I started doing some research with a professor and in that research, I realized I hated it. <laughs> it was <laughs> not fun. I, I realized, like, there's a good chance I'm going to be, like, stuck in a lab for my career my entire life, and that doesn't sound fun. Uh, and so during that semester, I decided to, to switch my field of study. Um, and I didn't, know what I, again, I didn't know what to do after that. I said, like, okay, we've narrowed the list down to not chemistry. Where do we go from there? Uh, and like I mentioned, I grew up in Florida where we had a bunch of hurricanes come through. Uh, there's one summer I, I very f- distinctly remember the summer of 2004, we had four major hurricanes just go straight across Florida. So I'd always been somewhat interested in them. Like this is a thing that I've lived through and like a thing that is important to people. Obviously hurricanes are a huge source of, you know, stress for a lot of people and like maybe if we learn more about them we can prevent damages and like keep people safer and whatnot and i realized at that point when i was leaving chemistry like wait meteorology is a field you can actually like go study for college it's like a a thing and it's not just like the tv broadcast meteorologist that's whenever i told people i was studying it or if i tell them now i have a degree in it they're like oh so you're on tv well no (laughs) there's a lot of like forecasting and research positions and that was more what i was looking into um, and at the time, my parents had just moved to, to Texas, and there's a school in Oklahoma that like, happens to be one of the best meteorology schools in the country. Uh, and so I transferred to that school to study meteorology, and I, I loved it. It was so much fun. I got to learn about these things that I had experienced firsthand for so long, uh, and I got more interested in like climate science and like climate change research and climate policy and all that stuff. And so when I finished my undergrad degree... I was originally planning on sticking around. I had an internship my final year, and I was probably just going to stay at that internship because they had essentially offered me a full-time role. Uh, But one of my friends pointed out a professor at a different university in Texas that did research that really lined up with my interests in the field. It's like, you know what? I'll apply. Why not? I have this job to fall back on if I don't get in, um, but I'm just going to apply for this graduate program. 
Uh, and I got in. I was accepted. I got to work with this one professor at Texas a and University, uh, and it was a really great experience. I really enjoyed my master's research. I was looking into, like, this is getting way too technical, but, like, the effects of, of clouds on, like, temperature patterns and, and how cloud cover can affect climate change, essentially. Uh, and it was cool. I really loved it. I was on track to continue. Like, I finished my master's degree. I have it hanging on my wall back there. It's about as useful as it is right now. Um, but I finished it, and I was starting my PhD, and then COVID hit. And everything went remote, obviously. Uh, and being in grad school, I had just like this tiny one-bedroom apartment that I lived in. And I finished writing my master's thesis from my bedroom. And that really got to me. I started to get really burned out, not necessarily on meteorology or, or like climate science or anything, but just on school. I, I felt like I was trapped there, especially because like literally I let's say I'm sitting at my desk right now and my bed is like three feet, one meter to my left. And like, that's where I was at all hours of the day. I just like barely left my apartment. I barely left that room specifically just because I had to be there a lot of the time. Uh, and it really got to me and I, I had to leave school. I just had to. Uh, and so I, I was like a year or so into the PhD stuff and I went to my advisor and I was like, hey, sorry, I can't do this. Like, I, I just got to go. And he's like, you know what? I understand. And they let me leave after that semester. I ended up finding whatever job I could. Like at that point, beggars cannot be choosers in a 2021 job market. Uh, and so I got a job as an analyst at like a hotel management company, which is where I still am. Um, and I'm now, I've moved on to like data engineering stuff, which is really cool. I was able to kind of parlay my experience working with these huge climate models into just more of a data analysis and engineering role, which I'm, I'm enjoying now. Um, but I obviously, I'm just not using my meteorology and climate background anymore, which I don't regret anything. Like I, I really did need to leave. And I think being super picky about, okay, I need to find like a job in meteorology and climate research at that time would have just led to me being unemployed for a year or two. Um, and so I, I'm very happy with how things have progressed, but some part of me is still wondering like, you know, should I still be in that field? Could I go back? Um, but it's also led to some funny jokes. Like for a while, I was like the weatherman. And there was a segment on the broadcast for a while where like Aaron was doing like a weather forecast and mm -hmm. it became a running joke. Like, hey, he's stealing my job. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, I, I'm really happy. Like I loved it. I'm not sad that I left it because I, I really needed to, but it, it's still something I look on fondly and I'm, I'm proud of it. Like very few people have a master's in atmospheric science. That's kind of cool, even if I'm not really using it. Like, it's a fun thing I get to say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, once again, as you were saying before, you just you made a decision. This is not right. This has to change. And you also made a decision. I can't be picky at this stage. I just need yeah. to <laughs> go with something. And, you know, it's clearly worked out really well for you because you are still doing that job. And I think sometimes we don't know what's good for us, what we want necessarily. We just take a punt and uh yeah. it just works out so you you're the job that you're doing now you feel like it's it's scratching the itches that you have kind of yeah i just i like working with numbers i've always been mm. like a numbers and data kind of person so even though it's not in like a field that i wasn't super passionate about i i like the actual work that i do and so it's it's crazy i like took this job in 2021 thinking you know i'll give it a year and then try and like leave and go back to weather or something um, but I just kind of liked it. I grew into it and I've, I've grown just within this company a lot as well. So I don't know, it's not too bad. Maybe I'll stick with it. <laughs> yeah, really nice. Really good. And I'm sure just as decisively you will know if and when the time is right to go back to meteorology. So yeah, yeah. just uh, enjoy this for the time being, I guess. All right, now it's time to know what the fifth Pokemon is joining your dream team. So who's going to be there alongside Victini, Metagross, Mime Jr. and Skuntank? It's going to be Weezing. I mm. love Weezing. Victini is my favorite Pokemon, but Weezing is a close second. Uh, and part of that is because <laughs> I have some funny reasons for liking Pokemon. Purple and like maroon, my favorite colors. Weezing's purple. It's like an early purple Pokemon. I was watching like the first season of the anime with like Jesse and James when James had his Weezing. And I always thought Jesse and James were so funny and I loved them. And James mm. had a Weezing that was purple. And I was like, oh, I like Weezing now. <laughs> um, but I, I, I chose to put it here because we just talked about weather a little bit and Weezing is kind of like smoky and smoggy or whatever, which is, mm. you know, 
maybe a weak weather tie-in somehow, but I just like wheezing. I don't know. I, I have, like, allergy problems sometimes, just, like, respiratory uh, stuff, and so, like, I don't know, wheezing is coughing. I cough on occasion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, really stupid, like, reasons I like these Pokemon, but... I've I've always just enjoyed wheezing. I have one. This is my this is my cube of non Victini favorites. Now I got a wheezing right here. <laughs> oh yeah, so you do. Yeah, I guess also. I mean, there's another link to look whether in the if it has neutralizing gas, then all weather True. is switched off. So it's certainly oh, yeah. it can be in control of the weather. When, um, when Sword of Shield came out and we got Galarian wheezing, I think part of its lore was that it like purifies the air around it or something. And I was like, right, oh. Yeah. Good, good for you, Weezing. You get adopted. Yeah. Galer- I got a Galarian Weezing right there too. If you can see him behind the scratchy. Oh, do yeah. you? Yeah. So he's, I think that's he's like grandfather. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I love Galarian Weezing's design. Um, that's so funny that your top two are Victory and Weezing. I don't <laughs> think they could be more different. I no. literally don't think you could find more different Pokemon. I mean, even just in the basic level of one is sort of land bound and the other floats. One is delighted, the other is just a bit angry. Yeah. One is very much sort of um, full of life and the other seems like it's down in the dumps. It's I love that. Victory yeah. and wheezing, just complementing each other so well. <laughs> Amazing. All right, well, before we discover what the final Pokemon is on your dream team, Jake, time to talk about your mental health journey. Yeah, I, I think talking about like struggles with mental health is really important. I think a lot of people are going through things they just don't share with other people and whether that's for some kind of stigma or just because they don't know if people are willing to talk about it with them like it's so helpful to just get it out there and whether even if it's just you like sitting at home alone like talking out loud to yourself I even think that can help but if you have someone that you trust like just prefacing what I'm about to say with like please go discuss it with them it's so healing to like be able to talk about it um but my my journey with it uh has been long and ongoing i have always been a super anxious person i have always had this like layer of anxiety about me that like okay something what's what even if everything's fine like something has to be wrong what's wrong here what's about to go wrong what's going to be wrong uh and that has been kind of the recurring theme throughout my life Uh, I've also had some really, really fun bouts of depression. Uh, There was like a year or so in college where I was just not having a good time for no particular reason. Like, honestly, not much was actually wrong, but I was just not leaving my bed some days. I would miss classes just because I couldn't get out of bed or like I I just didn't want to do anything. That's how it manifests for me usually is like I know it's depression when nothing sounds good. I know it's anxiety when, like, everything sounds bad, which is, if you understand that, like, difference. It's it's very different feelings, uh, and knowing how to, like, identify them and how to tackle them has been really important. Um, and then in, in the process, when I was going through all this, I started seeing um, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, which I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but here, psychologists are more of, like, the, the counselors, the therapists, uh, and then psychiatrists are the people who can prescribe, like, medicine. Um, so I, I got in contact with one of each and in, in kind of like my evaluation with the psychologist, the therapist, uh, I was also diagnosed with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, and that's something that I think is super misunderstood. Uh, it's something I often don't really talk about just cause it, it can manifest in so many different ways. Like the kind of like stereotypical media portrayal of OCD is like, oh, everything has to be like lined up perfectly and I have to like go wash my hands every 10 minutes. And like, that's not really how it affects me. I'm sure there are plenty of people like that. And that is a real experience that some people have. But for me, it's very internal. I I like do things certain ways or like I have plans in my head. And if those plans get changed, it's like a, a like a shock to my system. And I have to like figure out how to realign myself and so a lot of it is just I like how things are if I'm in control I like I like being in control of situations essentially and when I lose control of situations it can throw me off really bad uh and coming to terms with that and like that's just, that's not just some like oh everyone's like this it's fine like no I, I am actually like dealing with this condition if you will where I just know that I need to be more thoughtful about what situations I put myself in or like how I handle certain things. Um, that's why I don't necessarily talk about it too often is like no one can like trigger it 
for me. Like I don't have to like ask people to be careful about it because you know, what's something they can do or say will like set me off. It's, it's almost entirely in my control. And so I just, I don't know. I like go about my life making sure I'm you know, in situations and, and doing things that keep me safe and healthy. But I, it's, it's something that I realized recently, like very few people in my life actually know this about me. And like, maybe it should be something that I talk about more and, and maybe some other people have similar experiences that can kind of learn from mine. So uh, throughout this whole like anxiety, depression, OCD journey I'm on, like I, I found there are more ways than I expected to get help. Uh, I think counseling and therapy are fantastic. Having someone that is an expert in the field to talk to that can one, like confirm like, yes, this is like something that is affecting you and, and no, you're not making this up. No, you're not any, like you are, you are not worse off as a person because of this. This is not like speak to your character or anything, but here are some ways that we can work on improving your life and like seeking out medication. I was on medication for some things for a few years and I am a big proponent of that. If it makes sense for you, speak with your like healthcare professionals and find something that worked great for you. Um, and mostly like truly just finding your support system and like being open with the people around you that you trust can go so far. And that's, that's what's helped me get to a point where I'm, I'm so much more in control of everything now. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that, Jake. And again, thank you <clears throat> for your honesty there, because yeah, I agree. These are really, really important things to talk about. And, uh, you know, from personal experience as well, uh, it's a conversation that we need to uh, keep developing. And also, hats off to you for your bravery. And if you haven't told many people about this, for sharing it publicly now um, on the show. And I really do hope and suspect that a lot of people will find it helpful to hear about that. Um, I also, I think that distinction you've made, not that, you know, I can completely relate, but everything sounds bad in terms of anxiety. Nothing sounds good in terms of depression. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, I think that, that, that's really useful. Sounds to me again, just did my, um, inexpert perspective, like a really useful distinction to have. Um, and just thrilled that you now have the, have had the support that you needed and you're just sort of more on feeling more on top of these things now. Yeah. I also yeah. like the idea that it's, it's so much easier to deal with if you let other people in mm. and, and allow them to kind of experience it, not experience it with you. Like you don't, you're not dragging them down by doing it, mm. but just sharing this experience with people, it, it, that vulnerability I think is really important. And like, I, I also, not mental health, but like your like one man show about your cystic fibrosis, that was inspiring in the same way. Like it's, I think cystic fibrosis is something that probably people don't know too much about. I know I certainly didn't, um, but your show was really illuminating for me. It's like, wow, that's, this is way more than I thought it would be. And it, I, that, I really loved that show. It was, it was so good. I got to watch it and I was really happy too. Um, but just, I, I don't know, sharing experiences can help way more than it can hurt if it can even hurt anything. Uh, and so I, I've, I've been trying to be more open about that kind of thing with the people that are close to me. So, mm. I don't know. yeah, well, um, I'm very pleased that you enjoyed the show and it was very kind of you indeed to, um, tune into that. So, um, thank you very much, Jake. Yeah. I think we're on a similar page on that front. Um, all right. Well now time to complete your dream team. So right. who's going to be member number six? Number six is one of my other favorites. It's going to be Amphros. I really mm. like Amphros. Um, again, Gold and Silver being my first game, Amphros was like a key character essentially in that game because he had to go into the lighthouse uh, and find the medicine for Jasmine's Amphros. And that's like always stuck out to me. I think Amphros is just a very like, to me, it's a very like, it's it's full of light. It's like a uplifting it's there to like guide you on your way. It was from, from its lighthouse, and I've always liked it for that reason. Again, it's, it's sitting in my cube right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I just, I really, I think it's the combination of it being like part of the story of Gold and Silver, which was my first experience with Pokemon, and kind of what it stands for to me, have always made it like a, a like a warm and fuzzy. I just, it's it, mm. Infros is just a happy Pokemon. <laughs> yeah. Um, Amphros is the sixth member of the team. When we 
joined the call, Jake, and I saw the plushies behind you. <laughs> Whenever I see plushies behind guests, I think, okay, so which of these are yep. you? Sure. <laughs> We're going to be seeing some of them, I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I wondered if Ampharos would uh, make the cut there. Ampharos. Okay, would you say that Generation 2 is your favorite? It's actually not. That, okay. that is a fair question. Uh, it, it is up there, but my favorite is 4. Um, mm. I my favorite game is Platinum. Uh, I really like Sinnoh. It's my favorite region overall. Um, but like two and three are, are very close behind. <laughs> mm. Four is a good answer as well because of course Generation Four also had the remakes of the Generation Two games. So I guess that kind of <laughs> that kind of covers it. All right then, Jake. So this means that your dream team is Victini, Metagross, <laughs> Mime Junior, Skuntank, Weezing, and Ampharos. And Correct. so now, of course. I would like to know which of these is going to be a partner Pokemon. I mean, it's Victini. Okay. It's it's Victini. That's not a hard mm. question. <laughs> He's like, imagine Victini just like like sitting on my shoulder or like flying around me while I, I walk to the store or whatever. It's like. That just sounds so fun. He's so he's so <laughs> cheerful. He would be so fun to just like hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's you're you're right. He's good partner size, and yeah. I know we had that one competitive season after <laughs> the 2022 World Championships before Scarlet and Violet came out, where mythicals were allowed, and I can picture you just cooking up all kinds of things with uh, Big CD. I mean, did you? How was that time for you? So I I thought a lot about it. I actually never played it. Um, okay, because. I like th- was thinking of ways to make Victini work, and then I realized like it was never going to be like an actual VGC tournament legal format. So I just enjoyed it from afar. I loved the fact that I could have used Victini on the ladder in game, uh, but I didn't. <laughs> okay, well sometimes that's enough. Just yeah. just knowing the potential is there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear it, Jake. All right, so Victini is your partner Pokemon. Slightly different kind of question now. If you were a Pokemon, what do you think you would be? So I, I was thinking about this. I, I decided to think about what type I think I would be first. Yeah. And I, I settled on steel. I've always mm-hmm. liked steel types because uh, I think they're like resilient and they're like some flexible sometimes. Like and they can be used for a lot of different things. And then I thought, okay, what steel type Pokemon do I? What's what's my steel type spirit animal or whatever? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think I like my answer. I'm gonna go with Aegislash. Because Aegislash has its like two stances, it's able to like stance change or whatever. Uh, and I I like to be you know outgoing and perform obviously as a caster, uh, and kind of like have a good time in different social situations. But I also uh, very much need my like alone time, my downtime. I I'm an introvert at heart, and I enjoy just sitting in the dark and doing nothing for an hour or two at different times. So I think those are that's like the blade form and shield form dichotomy mm. for Age of Slash. So I thought that was a cool answer. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. I think um, as you were talking there and you mentioned Steel, I thought, oh, okay, well, if you're a secondary type, maybe you'd be psychic, given your, the prevalence of psychic types on your team. Yeah. I can see you as a psychic type. You're, um, yeah, you think deeply about things. And I wondered about Mitang, actually, rather than Metagross. I could see you as a Mitang. You're uh, mm. sort of, you've got that... Uh, Jolliness about you as well as uh, Steel Cycle, but I love that. Uh, yeah, the dichotomy between the uh, the more offensive form and the more defensive yeah. form of uh, Aegis Slash there too. Well, what do you think? Do you agree that Jake would be an Aegis Slash or indeed a Mitang? Let us know in the comments because <laughs> we'd be fascinated to hear. And speaking of you all, it's time for your community questions. I posted Woo. online as I always do asking for questions for Jake from you all. Thank you so much for submitting them. I apologise as ever if I mispronounce any of your names <laughs> or handles. So. To kick things off, Supernova SZ8. Any advice to up and coming commentators? And that can be for outside VGC as well. Just do it. Like, get your reps in. Like, find different ways to cast anything. I I think that's what helped me the most. I would cast any, like, online thing I could find. During COVID, I did a bunch of online stuff. Like, find ways to get reps in practice like ask for advice from from people that you've worked with or from people that have expressed like hey yeah like I, i'm listening and i i want you know to help you get better and whatnot and there's there's no better way to get into it than to just do it you're gonna be bad we're all bad when mm-hmm. we start that's not a secret like every single person you've ever watched on a stream has had a bad cast and like they're going to continue to have them down the line so don't try to be perfect in your first cast or like 
don't wait until you think you're really good to apply for things. Just do it. And like, if, if opportunities come, great. Use those to grow. If they don't, just keep trying. And that's mm. like, if, if you really want to do it, don't let a no stop you because you're going to see so many more no's and you're going to see yeses. Yeah. That's really good advice. And I think um, I would pick up on that on the um, sort of ever sliding scale front of as time goes on, we're just c- continuing to learn at all yeah, times. Of it's course. never a finished job. There's always, no. there, there's just always so much more to talk about, so much more learning we can do about what we uniquely bring to things. And uh, so, yeah, that's. Uh, just seek out those opportunities. Thank you so much for that question, and thank you, Jake, for your answer. Uh, now, Lundberger, Amanda Lundberg, Pokemon Go caster, would like to know, and if you want to check out the interview I did with Amanda, that was episode three of the podcast, so that'll be on the channel as well. We know you're a VG caster, but you're mm. also crushing in Go and TCG at Locals. Rank the games in order of how good you are at each of them competitively. That's so hard. First of all, shout out to Amanda. Love Amanda. Mm. We had talked about like vinyl records at one point on Discord. <laughs> and then she like sent me a record for my birthday. Like that was, oh. I love her. She's amazing. Um, so thanks, <laughs> Amanda. Um, but that is, that is tough. I think VGC has to be number one. I, I might be playing TCG more frequently right now, like going to TCG locals more than VG or Go. But I think I will always, you know, I mean, I don't have 11 years of experience in TCG. I, th- I think I could jump back into VG and like pick up a random team and learn the format pretty quickly. Uh, and so I think it's got to be VG at number one. Go and TCG is hard. In terms of like if I was attending locals in Dallas where I live, I think it might be TCG second just because the Go scene here is crazy. Like there are so many really good Go players here. Like I, I think I'm okay at Go. Like I said, I like won a regional in Go back in the 2020 online era. Uh, and I attended one like TPCI regional and got ninth in Go, which is really fun. Mm-hmm. But that was also like two or three years ago now and I haven't been keeping up with it. But I'm like kind of okay at TCG. Like I do well at our like local league nights and whatever. So I think I might put TCG second and go third, but that one's really close. Um, mm. But Fiji is always going to be number one. I came back mm. from like a week long vacation in August and like I flew home in the morning and then went to a cup in the afternoon for VG and I won it. So I was like, well, I guess I'm still pretty good at this. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. What a way to round out the holiday. Just yeah, get off the plane and exactly. win a local. Um, <laughs> yeah, interesting. It's amazing, again, that you, you're... Uh, you're raising your game in each of those. Um, <laughs> one that we haven't talked about, actually, is Unite. Have you given Unite a go? I played a little bit when it came out. I, I actually like MOBAs. I play a lot of League of Legends still. Um, but Unite, I just it just never really clicked with me for some reason. I I think I enjoy MOBAs more on PC, and you can't play Unite on PC, so that's maybe why I didn't get super into it. But mm-hmm. I played a little bit. It was fun. I was a Snorlax main. Loved mm-hmm. body slamming around everywhere. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. So many opportunities to get involved. Thank you for that question, yeah. Lumberger, and for your answer, Jake. Now, KC, PKMN, what's been your favorite event to cast? Oof. I think my... F- so, I- I'm between two. NAIC this year was really special. Uh, that was my first IC. Uh, I got to bring my boyfriend with me, which was really fun. Uh, New Orleans, I had never been to New Orleans before, so we got to explore that new city. Um, and there's there's something there's always something really special about the international championships that like regionals are fantastic, but ICs are just a step above and they're really cool. But I also had such a good time at Orlando Regionals this past year as well, uh, in April of this year. Uh, I got to cast the finals of that one with Gabby. We got to cast Wolf winning his ninth regional. Again, I grew up in Orlando, so I got to like go home and cast my old hometown regional. Um, Got to like go to the park. I went to Universal and Disney on either end too. I made a trip mm-hmm. out of it, uh, and so that trip for an event might be my favorite overall. I think Orlando was one of my best cast performances as well. I felt really good about how I did at Orlando this year, so I think I might have to pick that one. Any I see this year, a close second, but Orlando twenty twenty four I think has mm. to be my favorite. Wow, I really thought you'd say NAIC, but I know, uh, yeah, just goes to show. I mean, all of these personal memories that you yeah. attach to it, of course, <laughs> they uh, that's something that uh, no one else can predict. So, Orlando, twenty twenty four, 
Really interesting. Thank yeah. you for that question, Casey, <laughs> and thanks, Jake. Now, final question from As the Pokeball Turns podcast. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> if Victini were an ice cream flavor, what would it be? Ah. <laughs> I guess that's sort of a backwards way of asking what's your favorite ice cream flavor. I don't know. Well, my, okay, my favorite is cookies and cream. I don't okay. think Victini would be cookies and cream, though. Okay. I don't know. What would Victini be? Victini is like like fun and light. Uh, maybe yeah, some kind of like... a sorbet, to be honest. I was going to say some kind of sherbet. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe like an orange sherbet. I was thinking orange. Okay. Yeah. It's zesty. Um, exactly. Yeah. I quite like that. Victini's he's got yeah. some orange on him too, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Orange sorbet. Great. Well, or is it, yeah. I like it. Uh, also, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's probably more specific than uh, the question was uh, asking for, but right. we've really, we've really uh, got to the bottom of that one. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you for your questions there. And if you want to submit a question for a future guest on Chisingdra Chats, you can keep an eye on my X account at Chisingdra. I'd love to hear what you'd love to hear. So then, Jake, we've heard a lot about you up to now. What's next for you? Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm still, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I'm going to be sticking around with the VGC cast as long as they'll have me. Casting regionals, playing in regionals. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just so fun and like such a big part of my life that I can't see it going away anytime soon. So mm. a lot of fun VGC stuff. I'll probably keep playing like TCG and go to. I really want to play TCG at a regional if I can swing it. And just because I think that would be a fun experience. But really, mm-hmm. if, if Pokemon is anywhere, you'll probably find me there. Yeah. Well, more of the same is a really good answer. It just goes to show how much you're thriving. Yeah. All. And <laughs> yeah, I would not be surprised if we start to see you uh, rack up even more championship points in uh, we'll Go see. and TCG. <laughs> and you'll somehow clone yourself into three and compete in all at the World Championships. Oh, uh, that would be knows, cool. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, brilliant to hear. Now, finally, Jake, looking back from now as... Pokemon VG caster back to the Jake who and I still can't get over this found a copy of Pokemon <laughs> just on the floor of a ride at a fair and I don't uh, tell that story both, enough honestly <laughs> yeah yeah playing both Pokemon Gold and Silver what advice would you give to that younger you enjoy it like j- just have more fun I I've always enjoyed things in my life but I think part of that whole like mental health journey is that I I let things become less fun sometimes. And I, ref- I didn't find the joy in a lot of these things that I really loved. And so I, I would just tell myself, like, enjoy life. There's going to be tough stuff that comes up. Like, that's going to happen. And you're going to get through it because you have some some great support around you. And you, you're stronger than you think you are. But just find joy in things. And it's going to make life so much more happy. Uh, and mm-hmm. just just infectious like i don't know i I find that when people around me are happy it bleeds into me and i I like to think the opposite is true as well so Mm. just look for the happiness in things that might be more difficult to find and it'll make your life so much more bright yeah absolutely very very good advice there jake and yeah, I mean, obviously, it's. I guess it could be one of those things that's easier said than done in the moment. Of course, it's very hard yeah. to say. Um, yeah, just to take that zoomed out perspective. But I guess the more that we aim for that, the more that we try and cultivate it, the easier it becomes. So thank you so much, Jake. And the chat does not end there because we're about to get into Jake's rapid ash round. Quick fire bonus questions that Jake has not prepared for. Things like a random fun fact about Jake that not many people would know. Why Major Bowman? And um, oh, That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> if there were a seventh Pokemon on Jake's dream team, what would it be? Things like that. If you want to enjoy that, then you can join me on Patreon. That's below <laughs> uh, in a link, and you can support me as a creator. Obviously, really appreciate the fact that you've listened to or watched this episode, so thank you so much. But if you want a little bit more from Jake, if you want to get to know him a little bit better, then you can join us over on Patreon. And Jake, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for your honesty with everything you've shared, and it's been a really illuminating chat. So thank you. No, thank you. This was so fun. I, I really love this show and I'm, I'm glad to get to be a part of it. So thanks for having me. No, the pleasure's all mine. And if people want to keep up with you online, Jake, I kind of just shout out your socials then, but uh, where can people <laughs> find you? <laughs> yeah, I, my X slash Twitter is uh, at Major Bowman underscore. Still waiting for the day that Major Bowman is, is unsuspended so I can claim it. But that account's been like suspended since I created the account 10 years ago and I've just embraced the underscore at this point. Maybe one day it'll change, but for now, the underscore is still tacked on at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you're going and follow along with Jake. And 
I think we know what's coming. It's the YouTube spiel. If you enjoyed, please do like and subscribe because those things really do go a long way. Drop a comment as well because Jake's given us so much food for thought. Do any of Jake's dream team tie in with Pokemon you would choose or any of your favourites? We'd be really interested to hear. And uh, also on the channel, got vlogs of the events that I cast as well as silly comedy skits that I do within Pokemon. I stream Pokemon games. Um, shiny hunting as well as competitive content. So if you're a fan of everything the video games have to offer for Pokemon, then it's the place for you. Got my Discord community link below as well. It would be a pleasure to see you in there. And my socials. I've shouted out the X already, but I'm also on Instagram and TikTok. At Chazingra is the handle you need, and you can follow the podcast itself on at Chazingra Chats on X as well. Episodes of Chazingra Chats drop every Wednesday. You can get in touch with me on chazingra at gmail.com for any feedback or any suggestions for guests. The aim is to showcase as broad a range of guests within Pokemon as possible. Again, just to showcase everything that the community and Pokemon in general has to offer. So I'd love to hear from you. You can use the hashtag 6 pokemon one life story to spread the word about the show as well. And with that, Jake, it's time to get into your Rapidash round. So if it. you're not joining us over on Patreon for that, then it's goodbye from Jake. As goodbye from me. See you next time on Chazingra Chats, where there'll be another six Pokemon, one life story. Now then, Jake, how are you feeling about these questions? I'm excited. The, 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 the couple of previews I got, I, I know are going to be fun. <laughs> okay, well then, let's get right into them. So then, first question I tease there. Just